for being here. We love it. Join in with us as we start off this morning with Eye of the Storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family. reminds us that he is our refuge, he is our strength, he is our help in times of trouble when the storms hit. Let's turn to him. Please pray with me. God, we come to you today and as humans we confess that we really don't like storms. We don't like physical storms, we don't like emotional storms, and we don't like spiritual storms. We prefer it when the sun is shining and all is calm and all is well. But remind us today that there's deep power when we can find your strength in the middle of the storm. That even when the wind and the waves are threatening, we remember to be still, as Psalm 46 reminds us. When we are still, we know that you are God, and you are in control, and you are at work, especially in the storm. So God, would you calm the storms around us and in us, and help us to fix our eyes on Jesus as we worship and as we lift him up. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Jealous for me, 
Anybody here go? How many of you were big winners? Anyone? Okay, I would like to know, can anybody who is on the team that helped, or that was part of the board, can you just go ahead and stand for a minute? I know Andy's here, Kevin, uh, Cam, Beth, Matt, anybody else? Anybody else from the 5 2 board? Andrew Reinwald. I'm putting you on the spot here. Huge round of applause to anybody else that helped. These people put a lot of I'm told that we raised 22 plus thousand dollars. You know how many bags of food that is? That means a lot of kids. So thank you, Jesus, for that. You, you like to eat food? Me too. <laughs> Olivia, I say amen to that. Now, I had these two jerseys here last week. Who won the Super Bowl, the Browns or the Colts? The Colts won? 
Well, who has ever won the Super Bowl? Yeah. Bad question. So I brought these last week because I was telling you I'm cleaning my house out and I'm getting rid of things and I'm trying to downsize and I'm packing boxes. And I found these old jerseys and they're really not worth much anymore because none of my kids can fit into them. Are you guys Browns fans? Nope. Chiefs fans? Are you kind of happy? I heard the Chiefs did really good last week. Does anybody, anybody want this? I'm giving these away. Anybody want a Browns jersey? I'm good. Great. I'm Here, give this to your cousin. Yeah, Tre Trevor, my dear. It's too small? No, he's not. Yeah, give that to Trevor. If it's too small, he can just have it. Who wants the Colts one? Wayne, he's pretty good. Here, I'll, you guys can fight over that. Now, I want to paint a picture for you. Did anybody watch the Super Bowl? Everybody know what the Super Bowl is? It's a football game where a bunch of guys run around and throw a football, right? So the Chiefs were behind. They were losing. They weren't doing good. It was the fourth quarter, and do you know that we almost turned the game off? And I said to Jojo, this is kind of boring. And I feel kind of bad because their quarterback was supposed to be really good, and they weren't really living up to what they were supposed to, and I felt bad. And then in an instant, the whole game turned around. I like their quarterback. You like him? I like him, too. He's a strong Christian. Oh, you don't like him? But I like him. Because he's a good guy. He loves Jesus. But guess what? They turned around and won. And you know what the moral of that story is? Do you ever feel like in life sometimes you get behind? Or you're losing and you're not doing well? But you should never give up, right? Because Jesus turns everything around. You remember last week I taught you John 16, 33? You remember it? In this world we have trouble, but Jesus overcomes. I mean, we all win the Super Bowl because we get heaven. Is that awesome? It's even better than the Super Bowl. I think we should pray. Pastor Mike's been teaching us how to pray, so let's pray together. Can you squeeze in, Liam? All right, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for these kids. And I thank you that in you, in Christ, we are always winners. So thank you that Jesus reminds us that you overcome. Give all these kids your power. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Now, as the kids are leaving, this next song is called Trust in You. We started 2020 by challenging you to pray for 2020 vision, to see things this year as God sees them. Part of that is being able to take Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and pray that verse and live it out, that you can trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and let Him guide your paths. For five weeks now, Mike has been teaching us about trusting, about praying. Sometimes we pray for things and God doesn't always answer the way we think He should. Sometimes we pray and the answer is, trust me more. Even when he doesn't move the mountains, even when it doesn't go the way we expect, our job is to trust Jesus. And that's our prayer as we continue to learn to pray together. So please pray with me. God, we have sung the words this morning that if we trust you, we don't need to understand. And that's a hard truth to really live out in our daily lives. God, we want to trust you with all of our hearts. We want to lean not on our own understanding, but we want to let you guide our paths. But we confess it's scary to let go, to let you lead, because sometimes the path may not look like what we thought it would look like. So God, I pray for every heart in this room, for those who are on a good path, for those who are on a rocky path. Remind us that even if you don't move the mountains, remind us that even if life doesn't go as we expect, you are God. You are good, and we can trust you. So help us to give you our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh uh -huh. 
three in one, and it's this giant, beautiful mystery, but it's an insight into so many things that we need to know about God. That God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have lived in a perfect, loving relationship for all time. And they talk to each other. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Bible says, use words to talk to one another. So you might, maybe, you are like, well, I guess I kind of picture God as just this force that's out there. I want you to go from there to the next step that, no, God is particular, and God is the Trinity, and God uses words so it's kind of like level two. So level two is like, okay, I get that. God uses words, so let's move on. No, I want you to go one step further than that, and pretty soon you'll see why. I want for each one of us that each one of us would intentionally know that God uses words. So I hope you feel the gravity in that statement, and soon you'll see why. A great example is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And listen to the way God says this. So this is the creation account. And God, so God said, let us make humankind in our image. So this is the Father talking to the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is, this is us being able to listen in on a divine conversation. God the Father said, let us make humankind in our image. So this is a conversation that God has that we get to be in on. And then, of course, Jesus says in Matthew that heaven and earth are going to pass away, but my words will never pass away. So I just want us to begin with this intentional knowledge that God, as presented in the scriptures, uses words. Now we kind of go to the next piece. God's words are also actions. And this is one that you've really got to kind of uh, grab a hold of and grapple with because this is... This is interesting. It's different. God's words are also actions. His words and his actions are the same thing. It's not that way with us. Well, let's, let's jump back to Genesis again and just take a peek at this. Genesis 1, chapter 3. This is God saying, now just listen and just imagine this. God, then God said... Let there be light, and there was light. Do you see that? God's word said, let there be light. And in that instant, because of that word, there was light. Now, let's just set up a comparison. Our words are not like that. If I had my phone up here, I could say, let there be light, and then I'd have to go to my flashlight app and flip the switch before there would actually be light. So as human beings, our words need deeds in order to back them up. You know, just say that you're building a house sometime soon, so you're processing all of this, and maybe you're studying Genesis chapter 1, or you're a contractor and you're building a house, and this morning you're breaking ground. So you, you spend a little time in Genesis chapter 1 this morning, and you're just processing this, and you really want to get it into you, and you're driving to the site, and you get there, and the sun is, is just up. So there's just light over this spot of ground, and you're processing how God just was able to say, let there be light. And then Genesis 1.26 says, and we were made in God's image. And you're thinking, I wonder what that means. I mean, how does that work? And so you kind of do a, you know, a quick scan just to make sure there's nobody watching. And you say, let there be house. 
House! Yeah, nice. Alright. Benny, bring the excavator. We gotta get to work. Right? So it's like our words do not produce the house the way God's words did. Careful to watch though. Our words, hey Benny, bring the excavator. That actually, those words do create action. They have a little bit of power because they are eventually bringing things to reality. But our words need deeds in order for this stuff to happen. God's words act all by themselves. Another quick example. God said to Abram, A-B-R-A-M, right? this is back in Genesis, Abram. Um, God called Abram, and then God said, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. Abraham means the father of a multitude. Abraham was old, you know, and he may have responded to God, no offense to me, but I'm old, and my wife is old. She's past childbearing years, and we've never had kids. God, now you're saying I'm going to be the father of a multitude? That my descendants are going to be like the sands on the seashore, so numerous that I can't count them? And God said, yes. And when God spoke the name Abraham, that changed reality. Abraham, that song, I will trust in you, Abraham had to live that out. It still did not happen for a long time, but... When God spoke his new name, it changed reality. God's words created that, but now Abraham just had to wait for it. So again, God spoke and it happened. So God's words are also actions. And God's words are infinitely powerful. Let's just think about that a second infinitely powerful. Finite means it has limits. You slap an in on the front of that, it negates it. So infinitely means without limits. God's power, God's words are without limits. So in Isaiah chapter 55, um, for me, this one just came to life as I was studying this, and it's an example of how God's words change things. And so I want you to really zone in and pay attention to this. And if you really listen, when we read through the Gospels, we see that Jesus uses, he takes just the ordinary, most ordinary thing, and he describes it and attaches it to one of God's traits in a way that brings it to life. Jesus does that all the time. Here, we're going to see, oh, that's where he gets it, like father, like son, because God did the exact same thing in Isaiah, chapter 55. So I want to kind of lay the groundwork before we get to that verse. So God is talking about the water cycle, and just the water cycle. And let me just describe that, but don't let a single piece of this pass you by. Because everything that I describe is going to come into play, so hold on to this. The water cycle through plants, right? So water is constantly cycling from the atmosphere to the oceans and the land and then back. We're going to focus on the land. So all the time, water is cycling to the earth and back into the atmosphere. And this is incredibly important because this uh, sustains life on the earth. So now just picture in your mind's eye, water coming down as rain. And maybe you're standing at your garden and you're watching these drops of water hit the soil. And that begins the process of infiltration, where the water soaks into the soil. Some of that water is soaked into the plants through the roots. And then that water works its way through the roots and up through the stems 
and out, through the, out to the leaves. And that process provides hydration and nutrition and causes a thousand little miracles to happen inside of that plant. Things that would lay dormant until or unless that water comes through and creates life. So the water is soaked up through. There's a thousand miracles firing all at once. And then some of the water goes out to the leaves. And as the atmospheric, uh, whatever, as the atmosphere is right, especially when it's warm and sunny, some of that water evaporates out of the leaves and goes back to the place from whence it came. So that water cycle is constantly happening. Now before we enter into this scripture in Isaiah, I want you, the scripture is going to start um, from as the rain and the snow come from heaven, but the heck with snow, let's think, we're going to daydream, think of something great. So it's late July, everything is lush and green, and you're out in your backyard, and it's one of those days where you look up, it's like 81 degrees, and the sky is just that incredible deep blue, and there's these large cumulus nimbus clouds that are just kind of meandering across the sky. And a couple of them bump into one another. And the water vapor condenses around these little dust particles and just begin to drop out of the sky. So I want you to have that picture in your mind as you hear the word of God through the prophet Isaiah. And then about halfway through, you're going to see God takes this example and he flips it on its head and begins to use it for his own purposes. So with that image in mind, hear the word of the Lord. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and causing it to bud and flourish, and to provide seed for the sower, and bread for the eater. So is my word that comes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will achieve that that I desire and will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. Now that process of water vapor coming out of the plant and returning to the sky is called transpiration. That's the final step in this water cycle process. So God paints that picture and he says that is the water cycle through plants. Now, he says, let me show you the word cycle through humans. So now have that first image in your mind and listen to the second one and see how they are there. So God says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. And then he says, it does not return to me empty. When his word comes down and it hits the soil, you are the plant. So you might initially say, ah, my life is such a desert. You know, there's just nothing going on in my life. You are the plant in this story, but you are a plant with legs. So if you find yourself in a desert in life, you can walk to where it is raining. Go to where it's raining. Right? The rain is the word of God. You might be just working hard to expand your devotional time in the morning, or you might be just wrestling hard to put one in place. Your devotional time, where you spend time in the Word of God, no matter what time of day it is, 
That is you experiencing the rain. That picture of the daisy, you know, the rain is coming at the beginning and the daisy is like this. It is receiving the rain. That is you transplanting yourself to the place where it is raining. Worship on Sunday morning is you using your legs to come and stand where it is raining. If you find in your life, it's like, ah, my life is so dry, it's such a desert, I just, I'm not connecting with God. Pick yourself up and go and stick yourself in the ground where it tends to rain. That is, wherever the Word of God comes at you. Then, when you are there, according to God through Isaiah, the Word of God like water begins to soak into you through your roots and it travels through your roots and up to your stems and it nourishes you and it hydrates you for your life and within you there is a thousand little miracles that happen when God's word is working in you then some of that water goes out to your leaves Right? And when the atmospheric conditions are great, especially when it's hot and the sun's beating on you, a lot of that, some of that water, then evap... Now just listen very carefully. <laughs> See this. A lot of that water evaporates out of you and goes back to the one from whence it came. In the water cycle through the plant, that is called transpiration. In the word cycle through a human, that is called, anyone want to take a guess? Prayer. That is called prayer. It is God's word cycling through you, nourishing you, hydrating you, creating a thousand miracles within you. And you're so saturated. And even God doesn't, nothing, nothing is wasted on him. Look at when a plant is reaching for the rain, this is what it does. Right? When you are praying, you know, I mean, we usually do this. But when we really let loose and we begin to pray, it is just like this. And that, is that, that word is going back to the one from which it originally came. That is God saying, this is what my word actually is. And this is what prayer actually is. So I hope that we will never see the word the same again. And I hope that we will never think about prayer in the same way again. Prayer is God's word evaporating back on us. Last week, I really tried to make the point strongly that sometimes it's just so hard to start a prayer life because we feel like we are starting it. Like we have to initiate this. We have to invent this. We have to, you know, we have to like go out and actually push this to happen. But this example, Isaiah 55, it's in the sermon now. It's live with this this week. Did you invent the rain? Did you have anything to do with the rain? God sent the rain. You just have to soak it in and let it do its thing and point yourself back to God. And this begins prayer. You're not inventing. You're not initiating. You're not starting. You're answering. That takes a ton of of pressure off. You're not inventing this. You're simply answering, learning to answer when God speaks to you. So uh, prayer begins with what God does for us. And then we answer. So then the question is, how do we use our words? You know, and again, our words need deeds to make them concrete. Our words need deeds to back them up. How do we use our words to get in on this divine conversation? Um, and we just remember that God always speaks first. So, 
as we follow his word and we receive his instruction, that is us trusting in God. It goes back to the song we sing. When we receive his word and we soak it in and then we go out and do it and then we trust that this is going to bear fruit, this is us actually trusting God. So when we trust his word, his word and his action are the same, we are trusting him. God has invested himself in the most incredible way, and we'll never fully get this, but it's awesome. God has invested himself in his word. And then we hear and know that his word is Jesus, and his word is what we read in scripture. So if we want in on this divine conversation, the front door is the word of God. And that door is always open. So, I mean, the, the title of this sermon is The Marriage of Prayer and Scripture. And I really mean that. That in order for us to enter into this divine conversation, which is just so amazing, the front door is the Word, and the Word is always open. So I want to kind of end today with, okay, so that's, I, I hope that you're like, oh, I want to hang on to that and really absorb that. But now I want to say, what does it actually look like? You know, just walk me through an example of how this actually happens. What does it look like? So I tried to think of what is a problem that probably every single person sitting in this room has going on right now, right? What is a problem that every one of us has? It is probably that in some way, shape, or form, we are at odds with another human being, right? It's the common human experience. Is there anybody that's like, man, every relationship I have across the board is absolute perfection? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, no. So let's, let's say that you, know, you are really working to develop a devotion time, and you're digging into the Word, and you're trying to absorb it, and you're really like, Lord, I want in. You know, I want this to be a part of my life. But you have this incredible stress with another human being, and you go to bed at night, and it haunts your dreams, and you wake up, and you're mad still, and you're cranky, and you come downstairs, and this happens to be when you have committed that you're going to spend this time with God, but you're grumpy, but you're committed. So you're like, God, can I come to you? Because I'm committed, but I'm grumpy. <laughs> Is this going to be okay? And of course, he welcomes you. So you sit down, and you open up your Bible, and you begin to read where you left off yesterday. And you just happen to be in the Gospel of John, and it's chapter 15, and you just start reading once again. We're John 14, verse 15, and it's Jesus saying, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And you're just a crab. And you're like, well, fine. Well, what are your commandments? And then maybe he has you flip somewhere else in the scripture, or maybe it's something that you process early on, and it just comes up within you. And it's that classic text about human relationships that Paul wrote uh, in his letter to the Ephesians. And Paul says to you, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ has loved you and gave himself up for you as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So then you sit with that. You know, there's a couple of words that just grab you because of where you're struggling the most. And all of a sudden you find that you're not grumpy anymore. 
but you're very honest. You know, and maybe from a couple of weeks ago, you find yourself up in that power with Jesus, and your sins are not allowed in. They're down and away and have a fit, but you don't care because you don't like them anyway. And you're up there with God, and Jesus, you look at him, and you're like, I hear you, and I can see what you say, but I can't do it. I can't do it. And for me, Mike, this has come out of me on a thousand different occasions, and it always comes out like this. God, Father, I'm just not big enough. You know, it's almost like you're standing with your dad and you have a monumental task ahead of you and you know what you're supposed to do and you're like, Dad, I'm not big enough to do it. So then you can imagine that Jesus is looking at you and he has this look of intense compassion, but also an intensity. And he maybe raises an eyebrow to say, you didn't let me finish. And so you're still. And he starts over. And in John 14, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will talk to the Father. And he will give to you another advocate, a helper, who will be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth. Just pause a second. Truth is what God lives in. In heaven, there is no unclarity. There is no darkness. God is able to see everything as it actually is. Truth is the way things really are. It is reality. The divine perspective. Jesus says, this is the spirit of truth. The one who sees everything clearly. The one in whom there is no shadow or darkness. The one who is perfect will be with you forever. And he says, and you know it. Because he abides with you and he will be in you. And you stand up and you realize that in some deep significant way your life is different than it was 20 minutes ago when you were a total crap because you were mad at this other person. And this is what God did within you. It's his word raining down on you and you put yourself in a place where it rains and you soak the word in and you receive nourishment and hydration, and a thousand miracles happened inside of you. And then as some of those words go out to your extremities and evaporate, that is what prayer is. So what does prayer look like? Something like that. So we're going to continue to dig all winter and probably through the spring. Our goal is, as your pastors, that by next December 31, your prayer life, your ability to converse with your loving Father in heaven will be apples to oranges, night and day, compared to where it was at the beginning of the year. So hang in there. Let us pray. Lord, we want to say thank you because you didn't leave us. And not only did you not leave us, but you are so intentional in coming after us and helping us and speaking to us. We pray that there will be a miraculous opening of our souls so that we let your spirit completely in. Lord, change everything if you have to. We just want more of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike said last week that sometimes a teacher or a coach or a parent will say a word and it changes the situation. 
Friday we had a basketball game in here and the ref was making some calls and I noticed the power of his words. He could say something and it would change everything. Uh, there was a particular seventh grade boy, you know who I'm talking about, from the team we were playing. And every time the ref would make a call, this kid would get red faced and he would just, oh, because it changed the number of fouls he had, it changed who he was, and you just watched the whole thing unfold. And man, I was praying for that kid. I thought, Lord, he is going to come bust in front of all of us. There's something powerful that happens when words come out and we pray. I believe it or not, I pray more at basketball games than you would think. Because it does something to you. We need to be people who pray. Last night, we were at the All County Concert for Grace, and the conductor stood up, dead quiet, goes like this, and the music begins. There was such power. Mike talked about this last week. There's power when we pray, when we spend time in God. Thirteen years ago today, I was two weeks late, and I thought I was going to be pregnant forever. Anyone else ever been there? Finally, we got the word I had been waiting for that changed everything. Push! I was like, thank you, Jesus, it's time. And then those words that changed everything for us. It's a boy. And our life hasn't been the same since. Words can change everything. Please be people that pray. God, when he pours out his rain of prayer, it changes everything. Please stand as we get into this last song. This song is called Standing in Your Love. As Mike shared, you can choose to stand in fear. You can choose to stand in anger. You can choose to stand in your flesh. But stand under the rain of God's word. Spend time in scripture this week. Isaiah also says in chapter 41, to fear not. Because he is God and he is with us. Stand in his love and let the rain wash over you. Amen. Amen. Joy. 